Fantastic. Well, um, good morning, everybody, again. Um, I think it's always difficult when you come to these things to know exactly where to pitch it. And I, so, Nick, well done on the intros. It's great to understand the, the different places people are on that IoT journey. So I think, and we'll find out at the end, I'm probably pitching this at the right place, but um, I've captured a few of the comments as we've gone along as well. And if, um, if there are no questions at the end, um, I'll certainly come back and touch on some of those things. So... We, um, I'm from Connecting, so I'm the Chief Sales Officer, so that's a bit of a Ponzi title, which basically means I'm responsible for all of our um, business development and growth. Um, we're a SME, we've been around since um, 2006, um, and about three and a half years ago now, we took uh, our Series A investment and split the business into two. So we continue to deliver our broadband and networking services and, and phone systems and all that good stuff for SMEs in and around the Hull area. Um, and then we've grown out the other side of our business, which is really to address the challenge around IoT and how to help the UK catch up with um, our neighbours um, overseas. Um, we've been doing quite well um, as, as a 30 or so person organisation. Um, and that's probably been recognised in the market. It's probably the best endorsement. So we've recently just closed our Series B investment with Whitehelm Capital. Um, I think I'm going to touch on a few of the things today, but what I would say is it's a, a world that is changing extremely quickly. Um, we see our place in that as being the, and it, it sounds a little, a little bit corny to some people, but really being that partner, that partner that you can trust. So our, our value proposition is all around, actually we'll help you co-develop, we'll help you um, do the implementation and user adoption. Um, so for us, it's, it's partly about the technology, but it's more so about understanding you and your business or, or your organization. But we'll touch on some of those things as we go. So I don't think I need to tell anybody who's on the call today about the need to transition um, and, and embrace digital. It's never been greater. Um, as I said, I don't need to educate you. We can touch on things like adult population, people living longer, the pressures on the public purse. I mean, we don't even need to touch on COVID and the deficit and the devastation that's been left by that. Um, it's, it's here for all to see. So I'm going to skip over that because I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you your own homework. You know it better than I do. But what is important is to recognise that in a number of organisations, the way that we're still delivering services is, in, a, is a, in an outdated manner. It doesn't really work. It's siloed. It's inefficient. There's duplication. It's costly. And the way that we deliver some, and these are just some of those services, but the way that we deliver those services and services not talking to each other, quite lucky in my job, I get to speak to a lot of people in the public sector, across local gov, health, uh, private sector, they're delivering services on, for, to um, both those organisations and others. And whilst there's a lot of momentum, there's also a lot of opportunity to still break down some of these silos and actually start to get some of the value um, in the in relation to one of the points this morning about is it can it be cost effective? Yeah, it can. It can also be very expensive as well if you do it wrong. And again, I'll come back and touch on some of that today. Um, but there's got to be a better way, and I, th I think there is. So we've been working for the last last couple of years really to develop what we call is the Connecting Smart City Blueprint. Um, I am aware there's a couple of people I'm from county councils as well, so um, please don't feel excluded or town, parish, borough. Um, but we look to deliver a complete solution. So everything from the infrastructure layer, the sensor layer, and the platform layer are probably the three most important building blocks. If you're breaking it down, that's really what it looks like. Those are the things that really lead to giving you the data which becomes actionable, which leads to the outcomes. So Nick, going back to your point right at the beginning, um, I think I captured it. You said um, you touched on, is it, uh, I thought it was all, did you say is it all about the bit, just about data? Um, yeah, 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 I, yeah. The I smart think, collection of data, and then sort of yeah. using that to inform service delivery. Yeah, so I think it is. So for us, it's not about the technology. It's not about the widgets and gadgets. It's not about the networks. It's not even about the platform. It's about the data. But it goes a step further than that. It's it's okay having the data, but then it's so what if you don't understand how to use the data and how to adapt it and, and deliver it in a way that becomes usable for the people delivering the service then actually what's the point? And that's one of the, the things that we try and differentiate ourselves on is actually going beyond the point of just providing the data, but working with the operational teams, working with the service directors to understand as is today, understand the legacy systems, understand the ways of working, understand policy and procedure, 
understanding HR implications of changing things. So working through that whole journey. So actually just getting to the outcome set, I'm moving my fingers like I think you can see what I'm pointing at. But moving um, along to where we get to that um, insights piece is great. But if you can't bridge the gap between insights and outcomes, then actually everything before the insights is probably pointless. So how do we do that? Well, councils are talking to us about lots of different ways of, of trying to do this. So there's a really wide range of people on here today uh, and that some of you I've, I've um, come across before and, and met previously and some of you doing some absolutely amazing things. I, I think somebody mentioned the run from East Anglia and some of the work being, down, being done down there by Kurt and the team is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think um, if I was to try and summarise it, we see it really fitting into there's three different groups and three ways to start to embrace this journey of how do I get to this outcome and how can I use IoT to get to it? I, can I afford it? How do I do it? What, which bit comes first? Well, you probably need three elements as we see it to be able to make this a success. You need the connectivity. You can do, you can obviously take advantage of mobile networks, 5G, 4G, GPRS, GSM, Sigfox, and, and various other different net technologies that are already there. LoRa One, a good example. You need some sort of connectivity, whether you're monitoring somebody's kettle, as, as one of the examples earlier, or whether it's a proximity sensor or whatever else it might be. You need a network to send you information. You then need a platform which is going to bring all that data together from all this range of sensors or existing data sets, and that's really important. We don't, well, we certainly don't believe you. You just throw out everything you've got to start putting new things in, actually. I'm yet to meet a council that's not got loads of data. The problem is how do you refine it and make it usable? And then the third level is how do you de develop the applications and services to actually sweat those investments in the network and the platform to actually start delivering those real outcomes that we've talked about? And there's a couple of things that I want to touch on here. So we, we do the whole piece, so everything from in, connecting to the networks and the, and the sensors through to the platform, which is completely interoperable. We don't own your data. Actually, we train your people to work on our platform. So if you want to do your in-house development and not be wedded to a provider, we can help you do that. Alternatively, if you're not equipped to do that and you want somebody to just come in and provide the outcome to you via the, the application, then we can, we can do that as well. And what we really like to do is to get like-minded organizations to work to let work together. So when we get to this, as we, as we go up the curve, it becomes more and more strategic. As you get to that application layer, how do we get organizations to work together to not only share applications, but also look at how they can um, share investments to build new things or even share data? And I'll touch on, on that now. I'll just pause for a moment because um, one of the chaps mentioned it. Um, I think from one of the London boroughs around the, the kettle example. And, you know, that's a, a fantastic example, really simple IoT sensor detecting that something's changed from the norm. So we've got norm, 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 norm. Um, the lady in question, something changed, set off an alarm, intervention happened. That's, you know, that's as complex or as simple, depending on your perspective, as, as you can get. But what a brilliant example. And bless her, she's, she's still here today. But we can take that to another level as well. And you know, if I were to leave you with a thought for the art of the possible, what if we were working with water utilities and we're using smart metering? If we start to break that down and start to work at a level where we understand somebody's water consumption, actually, we can do a similar thing to what was done with the kettle without the need for sensors. So by share, bringing organizations together to share data that probably already exists, and build it, bring it together in a way that it becomes actionable. You can actually start to use what you've already got to drive similar outcomes. So I think I've been clear on that, but just in case I've not, water meter in the ground, 15 minute consumption data throughout the day, that 96 data points. It'll then tell you, you'll be able to build a pattern about somebody's water consumption. If that changes and that will come, could provide an alert, and that alert could then be sent to friends and family or first responder or whatever was deemed appropriate depending on that person's care pathway. Obviously, if they've gone on holiday, people will know those sorts of things because they're being monitored. But it gives you, a, gives you an example about how that richness of data doesn't have to come from going and sending out a sensor or doesn't have to come from build, um, spending an absolute fortune building the latest and greatest piece of technology. Actually, a lot of this stuff we've already got. And that application service layer and that second layer underpinning that 
can really bring a lot of those things together. So as I talked about, those are, those are our levels. Um, infrastructure is obviously at the core of what we do um, for a number of good reasons in terms of um, helping reuse existing budgets that may be spent on lots of different things and bringing them together to combine budgets to make things more cost effective. It starts with intelligent connectivity. We've got our network of networks in the middle and then we've got the, the platform at the top. But it all sounds a bit it sounds a bit salesy so far, probably. So I want to bring it to life and I want to spend the next five, ten minutes, Nick, if that's OK, just talking through some of the stuff we've actually been doing um, and then actually showing you what it looks like and what it feels like. I'm going to pick on a particular example, but hopefully what I'll be able to do is help you see the thought process around how we do things. And then you'll be able to think about how do you apply that to other use cases. Before I do that, just really briefly, um, we, I said we've had some successes, so I wanted to just touch on this. Just it's quite it's quite topical. So Andy Burton's the assistant director for Street Scene. He's also leading the COVID response at Hull City Council. Um, so we signed a contract with Hull uh, about eighteen months ago. Now we're awarded the business for a ten year partnership for a smart for our platform to so layer two and, and going into layer three on that last picture on that last image I was showing. Um, that's that's a ten year partnership. So we work with them. We're part of their smart city um, steering board. Um, we help understand what are the outcomes they want to drive, help them build the business cases, and then help them work out what's the best way to implement the technology and ultimately drive the outcomes they want to get to. Andy gave me this quote a while ago for something else, and actually it's, it's really, really interesting. And I, I'm not going to read it all out, but I've highlighted some points, and I thought, Nick, I'll share it with you guys today, and then the slides I'm, I'm assuming will be shared afterwards. But it's some really interesting points about leveraging capabilities and managing resources and bringing different organizations together. It was it's almost as if we've written this for Andy, but genuinely, we've not. This is Andy's own thoughts. He's got a problem which all of you probably share in the public sector around having lots of data, lots of sources. How can I see the wood for the trees? How can I take a step back? And how can I make that data in, in, the, in response to COVID? How can I make that actionable for social care for adults and children? What does it mean for transportation, et cetera? So the platforms really helped him to visualize these different things and more importantly, make them contextual because being able to see the patterns can help him make a different mind, help bring things to life in a different way. And the example he was given me before he actually put this together was um, they were having a, a director meeting and he was talking about seeing a lot of the data on a spreadsheet. But since they then put it into the platform, it started to prompt different questions to be driven. And it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit chicken and egg in a way. So there was a big debate when um, a workshop is probably more accurate than debate. When we first started working with them um, post procurement around the different data sets that could be integrated. And there was a real debate for quite some time about well, which is it, which is best to understand the use case and then bring the relevant data sets in. Or should we bring all the data sets in to see it in context? and then drive what outcomes we can we can get from the existing data. My personal belief is neither of them are right or wrong. Um, but what is absolutely clear, because I've seen it firsthand, is when you take things off Excel and Word and put them into something visual, as human beings, we make very different decisions. We use pictures to inform a, a much faster and probably more informed decision making process. And then um, you asked me about Sheffield, so I'm only going to touch on it very, very briefly. And the, the, the only point being is that there's a lot of organisations and there's had like some great people on here today um, in the private sector as well and love to catch up with you offline. But there's a lot, there's a lot of organisations that are talking about doing these things that aren't actually doing it, which is the reason why I want to share some of this today, because it's real. Um, we've made a lot of mistakes. I, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that's a popular thing for the public, for the private sector to say, but actually it's true. Because actually making mistakes is what makes you really good at what you do. What is it to say? Fail fast and learn quick. Um, if you work in IoT, you'll, you'll certainly understand what I mean. Um, so we work in Sheffield. We've got a five-year contract now with Amy, who delivered the PFI to Sheffield City Council. So they're um, do, um, delivering all sorts of services with us from waste management through to uh, parks and gardens maintenance, when to water the trees, when not, when to grits or winter maintenance and, and various other services. So. We've been working with those guys now again for around 18 months and um, yeah, it's, it's going really well and it's leading to further conversations. So the Mark Jones one's particularly interesting because Mark's looking at it from an environment perspective. 
he actually lives where we deliver services as well so he's been able to comment firsthand about the difference that it's made but what it's doing is it's opened up other conversations now with other organizations like yorkshire water who are also a customer of ours um such as in the private sector with cadence and and in northern gas networks and actually how do we work together for shared infrastructure and if I keep going on about that, Nick, I'll fast run out of time, so I won't. I'll move on. But if anybody wants to have a conversation offline about the opportunity for partnership between private and public sector and how do you catalyze some of that and actually bring it together to make it for joint outcomes affecting lots of organizations and love to have that conversation. So this is um, dummy data. I'm going to take you through for the next five minutes, just touching on something that we can actually deliver. Um, I'm going to use the example of waste management just because actually if you Google IoT and uh, use cases, it's probably one of the first that comes up. But I don't want to just talk about empty bins because that's pretty boring. Um, the business case is there. Everybody understands why would you go and send a waste truck to go and empty something that doesn't need to be done. In the same way, why would you bother the poor lady that had the fall if she hasn't had an accident? Unless, of course, it's a welfare call. You know, you, people don't want to be... Um, when it comes to care necessarily don't want to be it to be intrusive when it comes to assets we don't want to do it when we don't need to fix it same case with machinery we want to fix it just in time we don't want machine parts sat on a shelf sat there doing nothing if the machine's not going to fail for years so these same principles about monitoring something and having a reaction or an intervention don't just apply to waste they apply to everything so if i take this example um, we're looking here at a whole load of waste bins as i say it's theoretical data and um, we can see which ones need to be empty and which ones they're not. And then what we do is we build a schedule based on the bins that need to be emptied that have met the threshold. And then we use root optimization to go and, up and empty them in the optimal manner. And what it basically means is we empty stuff when it needs to be emptied. We don't empty stuff when it doesn't need to be. And that has the obvious knock on effect in terms of people, equipment, maintenance, congestion, carbon, et cetera, et cetera. As I said, it's, it's a pretty obvious use case. But what gets really interesting is when you build the initial business case around effectively delivering a more efficient service, cleaner service, greener, all those other things. What then becomes the next layer is once you've actually got it in life, it's all the added benefits that you maybe haven't thought of. So having understanding when a bid needs to be emptied, great. But understanding how the teams are performing and understanding something that somebody said to me in the public sector a few weeks ago is, I don't know what my true demand is. I don't actually know what the actual demand for my services are. I know what I schedule and I know what we do roughly. I roughly know what we complete, but I don't know what the outstanding demand is. But once you start to understand data, you can start to understand what your true demand is and whether you're over-resourced or under-resourced. Um, some of you might be smiling. I can't see the screen when I say over-resourced. It's probably a bad joke for the public sector, but you get the point. Are we deploying people at the right place at the right time? but also how we're we performing. So there's a, a few different things I'll, I'll show on here. So this first one is showing the performance of the different teams that would be going out and emptying waste. So you can see very easily um, certain teams are performing really strong on a regular basis. The two that I've highlighted with the red at the bottom, you can see that team seems to be continually performing well. Well, operationally, that should be asking some questions. And why is that team performing at a certain level and doing so much work and the other team might be doing less. Doesn't mean anybody's doing anything wrong. But again, it's data is providing an intervention to say, we need to look at that and understand it because actually there might be something, a training issue or something might be a really high performer. We need to reward that or it, it might mean nothing at all. But without the data, you can't make that understanding. The other one I wanted to touch on as well is um, one of the things that we do, which is really important is integration into existing systems. So when we um, when we take the data and we do the route optimization and then the scheduling, that all goes through the, the our client's existing systems. Now today that's generally been um, the confirm system for workflow management. But what we do is when the operatives go out and empty the bins, we ask them for feedback. So if they do happen to go out and they see a bin that's not actually full, we want them to log it. So those are the, the ones that you can see in the green there at the bottom. So by them logging it, what we can start to do is problem management on it. And if we have a bin that's regularly showing us not full, but it's reporting as full, we can start to understand, well, why is that? And we can proactively go to the network, understand if the sensor's malfunctioning or not, and, and just make that change. So to the client, 
is completely seamless. In terms of operational performance as well, we can start to get a feel for what is the demand, what are the expected jobs versus completed jobs. That's what we're saying, seeing up here in the left-hand corner. And again, that's also really important in terms of seasonal trends because after you've got 12 months of data, you can start to see what happens when it rains. Can I schedule less people if I know what the weather forecast is going to be? Do I need to schedule more people if I know there's an event coming? By having this sort of historical data and then mapping it back to um, real-life events, you can start to do something around it. On the right here, you can see what the average duration is in terms of how long a bin's been classed as full to be emptied, but not actually been emptied. So when we start, again, in this data set here, we've got a 50 plus hour average time near the beginning. And then without, with a couple of exceptions, you can see it's starting to come down to more like the 20 hours. Uh, and that's just how we record in terms of really um, related. But it's normally a full business day for a job to go through the system to be done overnight and, and, and so on. Uh, in the way that we've simulated this. Um, and then you can start to understand how you'd be performing in terms of SLA. So if you know what your SLA is and you input that in, then you can then measure your performance against that service level. So you, again, this was a piece of work that we um, proposed to Amy prior to selling the solution. So they could see what were the types of things we'd be able to give them. So we put the data in here, um, our data, um, and then we could start to show them, well, this is how you'd be able to see how you perform against your, your KPIs, your SLAs, and then you can start to understand what your risk and exposure might be if you're not meeting your SLAs. Uh, so again, really rich data set. But the point being that all of these data sets can be related to any type of IoT case where you're delivering a service, whether it's building maintenance and energy performance and you want to measure um, how groundskeepers or security uh, of work in the buildings and, and or whether it's in something completely different like transportation you want to see the utilization of electric scooters during different times of the day you can start to understand what the demand for the service is and then start to plan the resource accordingly and once you plan the resource you can improve the way that before that resource actually um, delivers that service so just touching on a couple of other things we can do. So we can start to look at things like um, grit bins and um, ensure we get ready for, for, for winter, uh, gritting when it's needed, and also starting to look at things like um, a grit bin's full, especially when you start to look at rural areas. And then other things we, we, we're looking at there um, in this example is around things like tree moisture. Now, obviously, there's no one going out to water trees at the moment, but again, Think about the business case, it's like all these things. The average cost to plant a tree is around 400 pounds. That tree dies because it's not been watered enough or it's been overwatered. There's a hell of a price there to pay. In this example, we can see what the tree moisture level is. We can track that then against the tree growth and make sure it's, it's developing. And then that can form different decisions to made in the future, whether we water it in the same way or whether in winter we need a different type of soil throughout the year so that when it gets to winter, it's not saturated. And then the piece that I wanted to finally touch on, it's one that I touched on at the beginning, was really around continual improvement because I, th I think I, I was quite clear that there's lots of organisations where we talk about trying to do some of this stuff. Well, we've really industrialised the way that we do that. So this is an example of problem management. So it's all right um, going and say, we're going to go and get loads of sensors and we're going to go do it ourselves. We're going to get the IT team to go out on the weekend and put them up. And that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. If we can do that, great. But it's in life where you find all the problems. And I, I know there'll be some people on this call today who'll be able to talk about it more, um, very openly if they so choose around some of the problems that they've had. This is an example of one of the things that we do around problem management. So this is showing a, um, where an operative out in the field has said, I've come to empty a bin. I don't think it needed emptying. I'm going to empty it anyway because it's half full. But I'm going to log a job to sit on, on my PDA to one touch. Um, application of a couple of touches and say I've I've noticed this bin shouldn't have really been emptied so what we do is we track that so then the set so the top report showing the total number of bins at this moment in time for example that were showing that needed to uh, that we did maybe didn't need to be emptied but the second report is showing how many bins have then appeared twice over that same period so you can see on here there's only one so that's great news for me. In theory, I would only have to go out and look at one sensor, excuse me, to find out what the problem is. But for my customer, it gives my customer confidence that the data I'm giving them is actually accurate. So when they're planning operational things and making changes, 
you need to have confidence in the data. I think doing some of this stuff really um, demonstrates that to, to our customers. So how do you underpin your success? Um, I wanted to just to, uh, finish off by touching on a couple of things around some of the challenges that we see. So I think really I've put it down into three phases. So there's the planning stage where I want to do something. We know that data is really important. My neighbors in other councils are doing it. Why aren't we? There's a delivery phase where you're trying to put it in place and get to user acceptance. And then there's in live. So a couple of things I want to just touch on that really um, have caught out a lot of organizations that we've worked with and, and others have got it brilliantly, brilliantly well done. So strategic alignment. If you don't have that top down leadership and that executive sponsorship within your organization, Things will just, the, the, they might get off the ground, but you'll have real problems when you get to delivering in life. Because there'll always be somebody who's got an opinion on it. And is it the right thing to do? Is it not? It's got to be a strategic investment. It might be executed in a tactical way by either investing in layer one, layer two, or layer three first, going right back to what I was saying at the beginning about actually, do you look at the network? Do you look at the platform? Do you look at the applications? But whichever approach you take to, to anchor these types of things, you need that top-down leadership. It's got to be um, then backed up by the a solid business plan. Business plans exist for lots of in lots of different ways and forms to be able to dive into IoT. And um, I'd love to have that conversation offline if anybody is interested. But you know, we're talking to organisations about all sorts of different things at the moment, from revenue shares to models where we put all the capex up up front to fund the whole project and then um, we we take back from the from the savings so a bit like the street lighting model but applying that to all the services all the way through to joint ventures so there's lots and lots of um, different ways we can um, deliver these things mike kenworthy i'm sure you won't mind me quoting me he's a cio at hull city council he said to me a couple of months back before i did a speech at soccer team he said the only time it's expensive rob is um is if he doesn't provide me any savings if it provides me savings and we'll find a way to afford it and I, I really think that rings true i think second part just touching it briefly delivery um that project management and operational acceptance are absolutely key um we can't do everything for you and, and i don't think yet most organizations would want us to in fairness we need to work hand in hand with you with really strong operational governance ensuring that people are, in, are engaged and then the last one is war gaming making sure that actually once it's in life, we don't just assume it's working. We need to test it and stress test it and test it again and put things right before we hand over into life. And then in life, really, really key to service management. We need to treat IoT like any other service delivery. So whether, you know, if you were, you one contract, your lands, your telephony, the, the, I'm quite sure that you have a, a rigorous approach to service management for those things. The same needs to apply for IoT. So 16th of March, 2020, I'm gonna finish on this. Um, Nikki touched at the beginning about should be a virtual prize. Actually, I think it should be probably a prize for everybody on the call, because actually, if you sit back and look at what's happened in the last year and the, the transformation programs that have been delivered in the public sector, and I say overnight, but in public sector terms and timescales, relatively speaking, it was overnight. To have everybody working at home pretty much in the time period that was done, and the changes and the adaptions made by the, the by the IT teams and all the teams in a completely different way of working. If you'd have said that on the 15th of March last year, that's what was going to happen and we'd all achieve it and we, this would be the new norm, probably no one would have believed it. So that's a year on. My challenge to everybody today is, what are you going to achieve in the next 12 months? You've got organisations with you today, uh, not just mine, who are actually really forward thinking. I've actually learned a hell of a lot and got a lot of stuff wrong and have been bruised, but actually now understand because they've matured from those failures and now confident in the way that we deliver things. And between us as a private sector, we realize that we can fund a lot of these things and do them in different ways. It doesn't have to be a straightforward procurement and handover of cash. So I challenge you all to say, what will you do a year from today? And if you look back to the 19th of February in 2022, back to today, what will you have achieved in IoT? Will you still be talking about it or will you be doing it? Let's figure it out together. Excellent. Excellent, Rob. Really interesting presentation. Uh, everyone, do you want to unmute and put your cameras back on and let's get some questions and some debate going and discussion. Um, I've, got a, I've got a really quick question for you. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, Rob? That'd be brilliant. There we go. 
Right, ju just my first question. Um, I am going to make this. Does everyone know what lo the, lo the Lorawan is? Does everyone know? Yeah? No? Rob, you just do a, a quick, just a quick, you know. Yes. Quick two minute. What's what's Lorawan? Um, <clears throat> it's a, from a technology point of view, let's keep it really, really high level. So it's a low powered wide area network. So if you think about the networks you're probably more familiar with, you Wi-Fi in your one. Um, it's made for transmitting uh, data, various sizes, all the way through to high density. That's what we're all on today. We're all presumably on Wi-Fi or we plugged into a router of some sort. LoRaWAN's very different. It's not meant for high density applications. It's meant for really low powered applications that send very small amounts of data. So it's not meant for, um, I'll give you an example. It's not meant for heart measure, um, heart monitor measuring, you know, in a wearable device where if actually somebody, somebody stops breathing straight away, you want an immediate intervention. It's meant for those low latency type applications like waste management and building controls and those sorts of things. Why is it different um, to a lot of other technologies? The key thing when doing IoT is going to be putting something out there that you can leave that's going to last for years and years without the need to go back and change batteries, change sensors. Because of the way the LoRa One protocol works, it uses very little battery. So it's a low power network powered by what we call a gateway. It goes out, connects to sensors, and it sends data to back. So average life on a sensor is anything from five, generally five years plus, depending on lots of different factors, which I'm happy to talk about, but I'll probably bore the pants off most of you. Um, all the way through to 20 years, we've seen the, meet, the smart meter manufacturers in the utility market now producing sensors, well, water meters with no moving parts that are lasting 20 years. So, you know, if you think about putting an asset out for 20 years, I mean, a lot of us will be retired in that time, I'm sure. It's a, it's a long period for something to be in the ground. So the other point I'd make, Nick, sorry, is that um, savings. So if you start to invest in a different, a lot a lot of you will already have done a lot of IoT with, my background, by the way, sorry, is uh, 17 years in telco with the big boys, with your Telefonicas and your Vodafones. Um, so I've done a lot around digital transformation. And we've been doing, I've been involved in machine to machine probably since 2010. If you start to think about the subs uh, subscriptions that you'll pay for your SIM cards, every time you put a sensor out, generally you're paying for a subscription. It's not cost effective. Laura One, you come to a, a wholesale agreement with your Laura One provider, and actually you, you, you can fund a lot of your investment just from your SIM card savings alone. Um, that's not really my opinion. That's just what I'm seeing in the market. I'm seeing lots of organizations getting in touch with at the moment to make that transition from cellular to um, either MBIOT, even LTM, but more so Laura than the other two, mainly because of where they are with coverage in the UK. Excellent. Thank you very much. That was just a quick question. Right, any other questions? Sorry, I don't want to monopolise. Uh, Mike Ward, you, you've either, you, you've unmuted. Um, well, I just thought I unmuted just to be ready to jump in with something, but I'm, well, I'm not sure I have anything at the moment. <laughs> but we, the, 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 the Laura... I'm, the Laura One thing is quite interesting for me because you're living, well, well, working and living in a rural area, I'm not aware of any um, projects down this way that are using it. And, you know, we have uh, the same challenges with bins and, and um, uh, around the area and so on. So, and plus, I, I don't know whether it can be used to fill in um, gaps for lack of um, uh, mobile signal or anything like that. I'd be interested to know about that as well, because we have a few areas where we still there are that still aren't particularly well served by mobile. Um, so yeah, any more details about Laura One would be quite interesting, or where I can go and find them. Well, uh, Rob, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I mean, Mike, uh, just to touch on it. Um, the LoRaWAN protocol is designed for tiny, tiny packets of data, so smaller than an SMS message. So you okay. wouldn't, you'd never use it for anything that was high bandwidth. So unfortunately, it's not going to solve your mobile problems. I have got a different solution that could help you with that. That's a conversation for another day. Okay. Um, <laughs> in terms of, um, no, joking aside, so things like fixed wireless access. Um, so using the satellite dishes to where you haven't got fiber, we can go and put fiber-based speeds in, which you can then want to let them services over. So, you know, joking aside, there is the solution for everything. Mm. Um, 
Laura One could it use for mobile? No, it couldn't. In terms of rural applications, we're working with a couple of councils at the moment around exactly that. So agri-tech and um, uh, visitors and understanding people. Think about the Peak District, and we've, we've seen it on the news the last year, haven't we? People going for walks and these these tourist areas or areas of interest where people want to go and exercise during lockdown. They want to understand what footfall is. Again, Laura One's a great application. Yeah, you know, a gateway in a in the right at the right height, um, probably cover up to about ten kilometres, even further. But the key point, the key point is where is the sensor? So I, I'll I'll just touch on that if I can. Hopefully, I'm not um, Nick. Keep me on. If you want me to stop talking, but um, if you think about, I'll give you an example. So connecting a street light, the assets above the ground, the sensor that's going to connect to the network is probably in the in the lantern up at the top dead easy to get to. Think about your mobile phone, the traditional thing is you haven't got a signal, you hold your phone. I'm not sure how much difference it makes, but we just do it as human beings, don't we? I can't get a signal. Exactly, exactly the same principle with um, Laura One. The higher up the sensor, the better, the further you can be away from the gateway. So for a street light, we might do 10 kilometers, give or take. The water meter that's half a meter underground, which has been one of our huge successes in the last uh, 12 months, We've just done the first UK scaled Laura One trial, which has been a success um, with Yorkshire Water. And, um, you know, on those instances, we're putting a gateway every 200 to 300 metres, because again, that's that signal drop off as you start to go underground it is significant. So even if you've got a gateway that's on top of a tower block or a th you know, 30 metre um, structure, because you're going underground, you're losing that signal density, de uh, signal strength and we have to put more more gateways out there. Okay, thanks. Anyone um, else? Sorry, go on up. Sorry, Rob. I'm just going to say, if any, um, please please reach out. You've got my details. If you have a, more of a conversation about Laura One, even if it's um, or Nick, if you want to set something up as just a Laura One 101, I could bring yeah. one of my. I bring I'm more than happy to bring one of my guys and who's uh, more intelligent and better looking than me to talk about um, Laura One and how um, use cases and how we plan networks and we can show you some of the network planning tools if that's of any interest. Yeah, no, that, that does sound of interest actually. Any, anybody else got any uh, questions or even observations? Ange, <laughs> have you got a question or observation or both? A question, a hypothetical sort of thing really, but um, I work for a large metropolitan borough council that's in the West Midlands. Um, we have lots and lots of issues as the, as the council. Uh, we haven't a reasonably high scale because of the size of the area that we cover. What I was trying to convince their management team to engage in this, what one service you suggest would be the one to target um, to actually convince them that this is actually worthwhile looking at? And just, sorry, it was Ange, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, hi Ange. Um, it's a really good question. If I gave you an answer, if I gave you a genuine straight answer to the straight question, then I'd probably just be a salesman. <laughs> I don't understand you. I don't understand your counsel. Your no, counsel. I know, which is why it's very hypothetical. And yeah, you generalize. I mean, you make an interesting point. One of the things that we started talking about recently around IoT is let's get let's get um, finance into the room because those are the guys who understand where you're paying fines out. Flooding is a great example. You mentioned the Midlands. I don't know whether you've been affected by flooding. Not massively, but we do have areas that are affected in bad weather, yeah. So flooding's a great use case, isn't it? If you could keep the gullies clean to get the road surface water away and prevent businesses and homes being disrupted. The long term, there's an absolute fortune being spent um, in the northeast um, because of the floods, Leeds, Hull, Newcastle, other places around reconnecting with people who've been affected by floods. If, you, if your house floods, you probably lose it for between 12 and 24 months. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the state of the dev devastation. So I know we see it on the news for a couple of days, don't we? And we see the pe poor people in the boat being, but actually you, what you don't see is the two years of turmoil living in a hotel with two kids and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So actually there's been a real piece, there's, there's been quite a few studies done as well around what that effect has on people and that feeling of abandonment by, the, by their council. Mm. Uh, we know what the negative effect that then has on other things and how they engage and lots of lots and lots of other things around social and economic deprivation and engagement in society and so on and so on. So yeah. that that could be one area. 
Yeah. Streets is a great one. Adult social care is the, the chap earlier mentioned. I'm sorry, sir, I forget your name, but about the lady with the kettle. You know, all these things are completely interoperable. Mm -hmm. If I was if I was to say to you, right, Rob, what, what could I take back as a message? I'd say, whether it's us or another organization, work with an organization that's got a completely open platform. Mm -hmm. So all your existing data sets, you can bring in what you want. Yeah. And it's not one one solution, one platform for one solution. It's a platform that can do a multitude of solutions. So we're using our same platform in social care at the moment. We're working with the prison service. We're working with the same platform with water utilities, with Irish Water and Yorkshire Water. We're engaged with Hull, as we've already mentioned, and, and Newcastle. So we, that same platform has been repurposed in lots and lots of different ways. Because all we're talking about is network, sensor, data, integrate into service on your side. But so whether it's a sensor on a kettle or a sensor on a tap or a sensor on a gully, or whether it's a sensor on a machine that might be smoking and whatever it is, it's exactly the same principle. And then what we do is we partition that off with user-based access control. So the street scene see what they want to see about bins and gullies and graffiti and reports of dog poo and everything else. And then the the what the environment team might just see certain things about air quality and temperature in the city. The social care team see things about people who are outside their norm in terms of opening the door, picking the milk, putting the kettle on and turning the TV on and they've been sat in the chair for 24 hours and not moved. So all these things are just sensor driven. We just bring those sensor data sets in, we build the rules if you like, and then we create the alerts. So, you know, a bit like Hive, if anybody's got Hive at home or any other home central eating system, you look at your phone, it tells you what the setting is, what the temperature is, and then you take an action. It's exactly the same print. It doesn't need to be any more complex than that. Does that, does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Give me some, some food for thought for how to pitch, basically. <laughs> to try and gain interest. So. Yeah, and the key, so it's a, interoperability is one. We're not going to ask you to throw out your old. Let's sweat it. Let's get it working. Let's think about what your procurement are you've got coming up in the next two years, because I can promise you you'll have something that you're going to procure. I've seen it a thousand times. You're going to go and procure something that, excuse me, in the next 12 to 24 months, Let's take street lighting as an example. If you're a counselor, you've not done street lighting yet, and you're looking at that and you think, I'm going to put LEDs in a control management platform, there's a million and one of them you can buy off the shelf. Actually, for the same money, you could, but it'll just do street lighting. It might do a couple of extra things, but it's certainly not going to branch into adult social care, and it's not going to be used across sector and across agency. Yeah. If you go for a platform there where probably for the same money, or maybe there or thereabouts, you not only could do the street lighting in that platform, You've then got something else you can then develop on for all those other use cases as well. Yeah, and we do have street lighting. It's one of the few things that we have actually done in the last few years. So, yeah, it's a good point. Thank you. Well, oh, same, same, same point for any other services as well. Yeah. Uh, Samantha, do you want to uh, unmute rather than let's let you ask that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I, sorry, Nick. I just posted a question in the in the chat because. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I've been part of a conversation with one of our partners um, where they mentioned that there are some sensors, I think it was around um, air quality, um, and there were some sensors that wouldn't work with LoRaWAN. Definitely. Definitely. So the so a LoRaWAN sensor is not interoperable with a mobile network. Mm. And a mobile network's not, inter generally speaking, it's not interoperable. Well, it's not. It's not interoperable with your Wi-Fi network. The intelligence is done on the, the handset itself. So think about a mobile phone, good example. I can connect, I can do a voice call with this by connecting it to Wi-Fi or by a SIM card, can't I? But the Wi-Fi and SIM card don't really talk to each other. The intelligence is in the mobile. And LoRaWAN's the same. So LoRaWAN can't talk to another network directly, but with an interface, you can bring those different data sets together. So in air, in air quality is an example. There's um, SIM-based air quality sensors, there's plug-in ones which probably connect to Wi-Fi, there's LoRa-based SIGFOX, there's lots of sensors available for, for the different use cases. But yeah, you're right, they won't talk to, a non-LoRa-based sensor won't talk to a LoRa-1 network. Mm. But if you, Rob, if you think, I, tell me. <laughs> Rob, can I, sorry, can I ask a, another question? Yeah. Um, in, in the work that you've been doing around the, the social care element, have there been any concerns around the security of, of the data? 
Yeah. I, I think with some of the partners that I've, and, you know, kind of internal stakeholders within Kent County Council, there was definitely a, a concern around, you know, putting sensors in, in people's homes and the data being identifiable in, in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So that's a, a really, really great question. And um, it's, it's a very, very long answer. And some of you might be thinking, God, if that's a long answer, we've already had some long answers. That's enough. Um, yes, 100%. You've opened up a, a whole different conversation there about actually what's ethical but le what's ethical but illegal or legal but unethical. That's not even before we've got onto data security, um, data breaches or anything like that. So, yes, um, we had a... Um, um, I was talking to a client a, a few weeks back who said, actually, we've dismissed Laura One because it's not um, it's not secure. Back in the day, you used to take the device out, you'd have a device ID and you'd enter it into it. So it was a physical ID. Well, that's all changed now with the version of Laura One where it's at today. So all the encryption, everything is done and everything's provisioned over the air. The play, it's a non IP network as well. So why is that important? Well, if you think about your mobile phones, your broadband, all those things have all got an IP address. That's how people are able to clone it and track it and get into it. Um, don't ask me how they do that because I don't know, which is probably good. Um, but I, uh, Laura One's on IP base, so it's inherently more secure. Um, I'd refer you in the first instance, actually, we've been doing quite a bit around CCTV and crowd management, people counting, um, and various other use cases. So the council that we were doing that with actually did an um, audit on us to meet their internal specifications. So in the same way that they store their own data about um, residents, citizens, we need to meet certain standards in order for that proposal to go any further forward and actually go into life. So their security compliance team spent some time with our um, my CTO and went through the various standards to make sure that we were an extension of, basically, we were putting something into their network which would meet their security checks. Um, but I think there is a, there's a whole other conversation about what's ethical and and how do you use data in an ethical manner, and you know how is that sensor secure when you start to print people's homes and so on and so on.